There we go. So aloha, welcome to another Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month presentation. Um, as we are having folks join us, there is going to be a poll for those of you joining on the Zoom webinar. And hi, I'm Elizabeth with the, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And I'm going to hand this off to Serena Fukushima with the Maui Invasive Species Committee to introduce our speaker and the upcoming presentation. All right, aloha mai kako, everybody. Mahalo nui for joining us for Iola Kanaloa, Restoring and Revitalizing Ko'olawe with Maggie, pa uh, Maggie Pulver. Uh, my name is Serena Fukushima, and I'm the Public Relations and Education Specialist with the Maui Invasive Species Committee. Um, just a quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we are in a Zoom webinar format here on Zoom, so we won't be able to see you or hear you, um, but please engage. Please ask the speaker questions, um, and you can do so in the chat or in the question and answer button at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, then please also send in questions and comments through the comments section in Facebook Live. And that's going to be on our MISC Facebook page. All right, so I want to just get started and introduce our speaker today. Uh, Maggie Pulver has lived, learned, and taught in Hawaii for the last 14 years. After receiving her Bachelor's of Science from the University of Vermont and a Master's of Science at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, she went to teach at Ho'ala School on Oahu. There, she developed integrated curriculum rooted in Hawaiian culture and place, interwoven with community and adaptable to the individual passions of students. Maggie is also a volunteer with the Polynesian Voyaging Society and served as crew member, education program specialist, and outreach coordinator um, with the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage. She first became involved with Koho'olawe in 2012 as a Kirk volunteer and then continued to work with the Protect Koho'olawe Ohana. She's excited to have landed her dream job working in service of Koho'olawe. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Maggie Pulver. Maggie, take it away. Aloha, Kako. Great to um, have you guys listening today and checking out the presentation. So I'm going to get started because I just remembered I only got like 20, 30 minutes. So, and I got a lot to say. Um, oh, let's this way. Okay. Um, so, for those of you who aren't familiar um, with Koalave, I'm going to give you a brief history. Um, it's actually part of the Mokopuni of Maui um, from a traditional uh, Ahupua'a standpoint. Um, it's directly connected to the Ahupua'a of Honua Ula um, on Maui um, and was actually traditionally accessed as a resource for that Ahupua'a as, as a smaller ili. Um, it has a rich uh, archaeological history. Um, to date, 540 distinct sites, uh, archaeological, historical, um, have been recorded on Koho'olawe the entire island is part of the National Register of Historic Places due to that um, extreme presence of archaeological and historical artifacts and sites. Um, but we all know it has a, a significant history of misuse as well. So um, with European contact came a lot of change for Koho'olawe. In 1893, um, British uh, Captain Vancouver gifted um, a herd of a small herd of goats to uh, Chief Kahikili of Maui and those goats were the start of ungulate control um, of the island's ve vegetation. So that small herd of maybe 20 goats turned into 20,000 uh, by the mid 1900s. Um, but also what was happening around that time was the island began to be used as a ranch um, with the thriving goat population. People saw it as a resource that could also be utilized for raising cattle and sheep and horses. Um, and that was until uh, our entry into World War II, where then um, all of the ranchers who had been inhabiting the island were uh, required to leave. They were removed from the island, um, although they did leave one of their invasive pets, which we'll talk about later, um, when they were taken off. Um, and then the island was used for 50 years as a bombing site and live fire training facility for the U.S. Navy. Um, until in 1976, a group 
known um, as then, it was um, Aloha or Aboriginal Lands of Hawaiian Ancestry, organized a protest. Um, they were fighting for land and access rights on Molokai at the time and um, kind of, you know, the, the unique thing about Pohoa'olawe, it was staged in this moment in time where, um, you know, the political climate was just right, the environmental movements were happening, um, Native people's movements were happening in the Americas. Um, so there's a lot of energy around all of the things that Pohoa'olawe came to stand for. Um, and so after the 1976 landing of what's now known as the Protect or the, sorry, the Koholave Nine, who became the founders of the Protect Koholave Ohana, um, the, the, the plight of Koholave um, really kind of amped up to the, to the national conversation. And then a year later, when one of those, uh, two of those warriors were lost at sea, um, Uncle Kimo Mitchell and Uncle George Helm Jr., um, it even further publicized and politicized uh, the fight for Koholave. And so, um, you know, largely due to, to all of those factors, um, the island or President George Bush halted all live fire and bombing training exercises on the island in 1990. And then in uh, 1993, the island was actually officially returned to the state of Hawaii um, and then put in trust for a future Native Hawaiian sovereign entity. Um, so at that same time in 1993, the Koholawe Island Reserve Commission was formed, and that's the state organization that I work for. Um, it is a part of the division of the, um, of, of the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So we are administratively attached to the LNR, although we have full reign over um, what happens on Koholawe. So um, they do not um, intervene uh, with our, our operations or have any um, you know, say in terms of um, what we do over there. Um, in fact, we are run by our own law. So uh, HRS Chapter 6K9 um, established the Kirk and established its role holding it in trust, um, holding the island and its surrounding waters in trust for a future sovereign Hawaiian entity um, that's recognized by both the state and the federal governments. The ultimate mission of the Kirk is to implement the vision for Koho'olawe by providing for safe, meaningful use of the reserve for traditional and cultural practices of the Native Hawaiian people and to undertake the restoration of the island and its waters. Because it was used as a bombing range, we have a saying, once a bombing range, always a bombing range. So although uh, the Navy did fulfill part of its kuleana in um, removing exploded, unexploded ordnance and, and the shrapnel and frag from um, previously exploded ordnance from roughly 75% of the island, 25% um, of it was left uncleared. So those red areas you're seeing in this map um, mostly consist of steep gulches, um, areas that maybe were really difficult to access with the machinery available at the time. Um, so uh, steep gulches, sheer cliffs, um, thick brush, uh, things, uh, things like that. So the 25% of the red area you see is uncleared where so um, unexploded ordnance still exists. The yellow areas um, were cleared surface only. So what that looked like would be walk, people walking through um, and just identifying what they see right on the ground. And then the green areas, which were areas of heavy use um, in terms of significant cultural sites and potential planting and work areas for the future, those were subsurface cleared back in uh, between 1994 and 2004. Um, so you can see about 25% of the island, that green area, or sorry, about 10% of the island, that green area it was subsurface cleared and about 75% was surface cleared. None of the waters were ever cleared. Um, so that is why it is really important that we are always communicating with the public that they are not entering the reserve. Um, it's legal to enter the reserve without the support of Kirk or PKO um, and or the approval. Uh, we do have permitted trolling um, two weekends a month through the Kirk that uh, fishermen are allowed to register their boats and register with us. And then um, when they go in for the two day permitted trolling, they can stay underway as to not drop anchor and worry about any of the unexploded ordnance in the water. And then they have to report to us what they catch at the end of the day. Um, so that's the kind of the only other way outside of our volunteer program that you're um, able to access the reserve. 
when we bring volunteers and project partners to camp, uh, we stay in Honokanai'a, which is located on the southwest part of the island in the Ili of Kaili Kahiki. Um, our base camp is fully self-sustainable. So we produce our own water, our own energy. Um, we do have to bring in all our own food on supply runs at the beginning of the access, because unfortunately we don't have a setup to be able to grow all of our own food yet out there and be sustained off the Aina in terms of um, sustenance. However, uh, we are able to function with our own utilities, dealing with our own waste and our own energy and our own water production. That's largely due to a capital improvement we had um, about four years ago now, where we were able to um, install an entire PV field um, that converts electricity power for base camp. And we also improved our um, reverse osmosis system, um, allowing us to pump um, about 10,000 gallons of water a week while we're out there, maybe a little more. Um, and saved us over 6,000 gallons um, uh, or brought us down uh, to a, like, we do like 60 gallons of fuel maybe a year when we need to kick them on um, during the winter months, the generators, when the sun's not quite up yet, when we're ready to start cooking breakfast at four in the morning, five in the morning. Um, but for the most part, uh, we are fully self-sustainable out there in terms of our utilities. While I know this focus is invasive species, we also fight a couple of other challenges out on Kohol Lave. Um, our biggest one is like uh, is, is erosion, um, the loss of our topsoil due to overland sheep flow and wind loss. So it's estimated that we lose about two, well, when the study was done in the 90s, it was estimated that we were losing about 2 million tons of soil a year due to these erosive powers. Um, we're hoping to try and write a grant to do a reanalysis of what that looks like now um, based on the last you know, 20 year, uh, almost 20 years of restoration work combating that. So um, that would be an interesting comparison um, if we can get some money to be able to redo that study and now see what we're actually losing thanks to some of the efforts that we're putting in, which I'll also talk about. Um, attached to that, a uh, second challenge we deal with in the ocean side of things, you know, everything's connected, Malpa to Makai. So all of that erosion ultimately leads to a lot of sedimentation in our nearshore marine resource environment. So um, that, that sedimentation settles. And then when we have big surf events or um, big storm events, it can be resuspended and cause a secondary um, harm to the reef that it covered the first time. Another issue we face is um, the, uh, like I was mentioning, people coming into the reserve without permission and taking resources without being part of our permitted trolling program. We um, luckily though so far in 2022 haven't caught any violators in the reserve, but in 2020 and 2021, we did find quite a few. Um, unfortunately, once they see our boat, they usually hightail it out of there. They know they're not supposed to be in there. Um, so we often only catch the guys who, either feign not knowing or maybe really don't know. And most of the time they turn around when they see us, but it, it can, it has been a significant problem in terms of um, what we've been seeing in maybe some of our OPE surveys and some of our fish surveys. But back to kind of the main focus of, of what is the Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, we also have a huge issue with invasive species. So I mentioned that, um, you know, not listed on this sign because we do our best to know we don't have any cats on our boat. But one of our biggest um, struggles in terms of invasive species on islands um, is cats. So I mentioned the ranchers had to leave without any sort of notice. One of the big things they left was their cats, um, you know, that were probably helping them deal with mice um, and maybe rats, but we haven't seen rats out there in a really long time. Um, but, you know, to control like a house, you know, keeping the pests away. So when they left, they left their maybe dozen cats or, or oh, I'm not quite sure how many it started with, but we do now have a thriving invasive cat population on island, estimated probably about 1500 cats. Uh, we are hoping to write some grants in the near future and work with island conservation to enact a cat eradication plan. Um, that'll go a long way to helping preserve the native bird and endangered bird um, populations that we know roost and nest out on um, island, um, but also even just our, not just seabirds, but our pueo. Um, unfortunately, well, one good thing was in May of 2020, uh, we actually found a uh, 
baby pueo, a fledgling pueo that was estimated to be about four days away from flying, um, born on Puholave in its ground nest. Um, so that was really exciting to know that the, to know and have confirmed proof that the pueo are in fact not just coming here to eat, but they're also coming here to reproduce. Um, and then fast forward to this past summer when we were doing a survey and we found like the shredded wings and bones of pueo uh, in, <laughs> next to some cat teeth and, and, and claws. Um, but also found some uh, dead cat skull amidst a scat or cat bones amidst a uh, um, owl pellet. So they're fighting back a little bit them as best as they can, maybe. Um, so yeah, cats are a big problem for us. Uh, these are the ones we're trying to keep away that are on this side. Thankfully, we don't have any cokey frogs. Um, or little fire ants out yet. We don't have any mongoose. We do have tons of non-native plants and that's one of our biggest jobs is to remove them. So plenty of halicoa, kiave, buffalo grass. Um, those are kind of the big ones, Bermuda grass, the big ones that we combat on a day-to-day -day basis, um, California grass. Uh, luckily rats, like I said, we haven't seen any in a really long time on island. And this season, the mice haven't showed up yet, which is a little bit, um, not concerning because we know they're coming because we had rain, but just interesting that we aren't seeing them yet. Um, so we'll be, be waiting for when they decide to infiltrate and flood our bunk houses um, in the coming months of spring. Um, but so we try our best to make sure we don't bring anything new. We have enough, uh, you know, um, enemies out there as it is fighting the established invasive weeds that are out on Coho Olave. So we do our, we really try to do our best to not bring anything new in with us when we come in. A lot of the time, Koho Olave um, is pretty dry. Uh, it's in the rain shadow of Haleakala. So if we want to really, um, and those invasive species are taking a lot of the groundwater available to native plants, you know, um, Kiave and Kohali, they're really aggressive. They have really aggressive tap roots. And so a lot of the water resources that are possibly present on island are being absorbed and used up by those aggressive invasive species. So when we want to put new plants out, we got to help them out a little bit. One of the resources we have on island is a water catchment tank that consists of a one acre roof and three storage tanks that can hold up to 600,000 gallons of water at a time. And then we use solar panels and pumps to pump the water down to the um, irrigation, through the irrigation systems and down to the planting sites. One method we use, um, particularly out of the hard pan where we maybe don't have those invasive weeds yet because it's just bare rock. Um, when we had some CIP money back in 2019 and 2018, we were using an auger to actually put holes into the hard pan and then the native plants in right on drip irrigation. So on your left is what it looks like when it starts. And on your right is what it looks like after give it a good five years um, of, of being nurtured every once in a while by water, not always. If they don't have it, they don't get it. Um, but for at least the first few months, we try to give them a little bit of drip each time we're out to get them established. And then we kind of send them off on their own to do their best. Um, I really like this photo. It's a, our Department of Health planting area, DOH4. We're currently um, working and maintaining in that area, but it was started five years ago. And these are plants that were put out one of the first access and you can just see how happy they are. Um, we try to do companion planting with a couple of different species of natives together, you know, not like unlike humans, plants like having friends too. And so they grow better when they have some moral support. Other um, techniques we've tried out in the hard pan, uh, rock mounds on drip irrigation. So you can see under this ohi, we started out with just a mound of gravel and a couple of baby plants. And again, with the support of each other, they're thriving. And then we also build what's called wattles um, or corridors where we use geotextile, combination of geotextiles and rocks and burlap um, to create these, you know, raised, in essence, a raised planter bed um, on irrigation as well. So we're hoping that all of these things can serve as kipuka or little resources of native life that will naturally um, drop its own seed and hopefully spread out into the hard pan. So with the ending of CIP though, we don't, we haven't had funding to be able to auger or do irrigation setup. So we had to get creative and particularly with COVID, we then had less volunteers and less support in the field. Um, so Paul kind of shifted, our restoration manager kind of shifted gears doing um, from irrigation planting to uh, wadi planting is what he calls it. So these are natural depressions and um, 
little uh, rivulets along the hard pan where water is naturally flowing and aggregating during large scale rain events or any rain events out on island. And so what we're seeing is the plants put in these areas, um, they actually are only given a little drink of water, right? We put them in and then we kind of let them do their thing and say bye. And uh, we're seeing that in these areas where that natural water flow happens during rate events that they're really thriving and getting big. So um, we've talked about even maybe with the return of some funding with these bills we have in, in the ledge or even um, with some future grants, just focusing on these areas because um, these plants then have, in our opinion, you know, they, they're they fighting the elements themselves and are gonna be able to be the ones that really thrive on whole lobby and create babies and cakey that are gonna be able to withstand um, the intense conditions that they have to thrive in on island. Um, you might even say, you know, what if we don't have plants? Because without, without funding, we can't buy new seedlings. Um, and all of our seeds, come from Kohlabe. So we have contracts with nurseries here on Maui where they actually, um, as part of our, our, our agreement, you know, in paying for our plants from them, they're using seed from Kohlabe. Um, But sometimes, you know, we don't have plants. So we just take the seed itself, pop it in the little um, kipuka of rocks that we've created for it. And tell you what, sometimes we even get lucky, they sprout too. So that one on the bottom is um, ohai that was planted from seed in the, in the, area that's pictured above and below. And when I returned to the site, um, three months later, we had actually had seeds that sprouted um, and were starting to take hold. So that was really exciting with no help. You know, they just, they did that all on their own with whatever water they got from rain that was brought to island. We also do coastal restoration. Um, so in another area um, on the island in Honokanaia, Keana Keiki, we're doing akiaki plantings, um, kind of that Again, nurturing that Malka to Makai relationship in terms of restoration and creating these little areas of native plants that we hope will start to take a hold and be able to fight out the invasives that want to take over. Um, particularly what I find interesting with the with the um, coastal planting projects that we have going on. So buffalo grass is really the big issue um, in those areas. It has just taken over, largely due to the fire we had in 2020. Um, buffalo grass is fire adapted, so it was able to thrive after um, you know fire had cleared space for the seeds to pop and grow. Um, so Dean and the Ocean Program, they really developed this cool method of um, using solarization to kill the buffalo grass. And so they'll lay down tarps, um, bisqueen, different, different resources we have on island um, in a patch and then let that die off after for a month. And then on, upon the next access, they'll clear out what was um, killed in, in that area, plant the akiaki. And what they're seeing um, is that once that happens, once the invasives are removed, the akiaki can really take hold and just expand and, and thrive. So um, I don't know if you can see in the bottom right picture, but all of that is akiaki um, that, and it kind of spreads as far back as you've been to Koala in the base camp, all the way to the road. And so we just got a new grant um, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to focus on removal of buffalo grass and koahole and um, kiave from that area and hopefully try to turn four acres of um, invasives into four acres of natives um, and see the effects it'll have on the seasonal wetland that's there. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. That's pretty exciting. We also do seed dispersal down at the coast. So while we're putting the little tiny shrub and grass seeds up in the kipuka, rock kipuka up in uh, Malka areas, we also are tossing hao, ko, and milo seeds that come right from base camp into the um, rivulet exits down in Honokanaia um, and in kind of the little rock crevices and different areas where they might take hold. And we are also seeing that those are sprouting um, and creating little safe havens for themselves in those areas. We also regularly monitor for soil erosion uh, using transect data and soil erosion pins and uh, infiltration rates. And we pair that with uh, sediment measurements um, using our sediment tubes to kind of, like I said, it'd be really cool to actually have some money to do a bigger study all over the island because we only do this in two sites right now um, just to kind of monitor our marine resources in those areas and the effects of the sedimentation on those marine resources. And then we're also just really tracking the soil erosion pins to show that we are slowing erosion in these areas that we're restoring um, with native plants. I know it's not a focus, but another big thing we do is invas uh, is marine debris removal. Um, and part of that also connects, in my opinion, to invasive species, because that's how they we can bring things in. We also found mangrove seeds miss the marine debris um, on that access. And so being able to, again, 
do these projects in different areas around the island that kind of all work together. So by being there to remove marine debris, we're also preventing another majorly invasive species from coming in and establishing itself in that bay. Um, these are the guys we are trying to protect and hopefully encourage to come home once we can get rid of the, their counterparts that make it difficult for them to survive. Um, I actually just today was contacted about, we have a really, you know, some people would say cool photo, I would say heartbreaking photo of a cat track highway around a monk seal and then a cat standing right next to a monk seal that's sleeping. Um, I chose to not put that photo in here because I'd like to see the things that we are protecting and hopefully helping to survive as we slowly remove those pressures on them, um, both, you know, animal invasives and plant invasives. Um, that's the top right is the baby pueo that we saw sitting in the grass in May of 2020. Um, we also have the, a new um, a new kind of resident female monk seal that moved in about a year and a half ago. I say moved in because we see her very, very often. And we were just notified by Noah that she's probably going to maybe be ready for pupping this year. So we got to keep our eyes out and she tends to haul out right by base camp. So we're going to have to be really mindful of um, what she's got going on this year. And as I said, I have a goal personally in my position to be able to write a grant to hopefully get us that cat eradications place um, so we can really create a safe haven for those guys and for birds like the Wa'akane on the bottom, um, just trying to find their place in this big bad world. In summary, we spent 18 years managing restoration on island, escorted 14,703 volunteers, We've reintroduced 473,218 native plants into the landscape and we've removed 53 tons of marine debris. All in all, so that this place will be here and in pretty good shape when my son, who is two and a half, is ready to come out and lead his first group as either a Kirk employee or a PKO <laughs> volunteer. Um, and continue the good work beyond my time here on Kahu'olawe. Um, and again, we do this not just so key, but so that all of um, Hawaii's children, both Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian, can experience this place and know what it means to take care of something that they love. Um, so with that, I think I'm, yep, I'm perfect on my 20 to 30 minutes of talking, and I will turn it over to you guys for questions. Awesome, mahalo Maggie for that presentation. Wow, I just almost felt like I was back there through your photos a little bit and looking at all the efforts and work that you folks are doing. Um, we wanna turn it over to our participants. If anybody has any questions for Maggie, please put it in the chat um, or the Q&A on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, we are still live on Facebook so you can ask your questions there and we can answer it in real time. Um, otherwise, if you're seeing this after the recording, then please put that in and we can tag Kirk as well. Um, so let me just check. Yeah, if anybody has questions, put it in. And I just wanted to, while we wait, oh, there we go. Um, so Monty has a question. So not to diminish the amazing work, but can you speak to the percentages of land that still need to be restored or that you have you know, planned um, to do restoration for future, future work? That's a great question. Um, I actually also have a little mini side projects that my um, GIS land specialist and I wanna work on. We actually wanna map all of our um, past restoration projects in terms of acreage. I We actually haven't, done that on a single map entity, you know, it's all in kind of piecemealed project reports. Um, but I can give a rough estimate. So for example, like for the hard pan, you know, it's estimated that about 30% of the island was left as barren hard pan after goats and the cattle and the sheep and the military. Um, so we estimate that we restored about, and so let's see, acreage. So about a third of the island, that'd be about 9,000 acres. The island's roughly 27,000. And so of that 9,000, I think we've outplanted in maybe ballpark, like, 100 acres of hard pan, maybe a little more. So there's a lot of a lot of um, hard pan left to restore. And I would I honestly don't know an exact percentage. So this would be a really good question for our restoration team. And I can get back to all you guys to kind of see if we have some metrics to actually measure that in terms of 
um, beyond like what our acreage for our past uh, restoration project sites would be. Um, but I would say, you know, if I had to kind of think about it off, off the top of my head, probably about 90, 85 to 90% of the island still needs to be actively outplanted with native plants to really even stand a chance. And of that, probably about, I would say 70% of the island, maybe 65% is pretty um, overrun with invasive species in terms of like different areas being grasslands or um, like uh, Kiave and Kohaoli, um mini forests, mini dryland forests. Um, but the thing about that is, is, you know, we believe that this kind of work is exponential, right? So we're still really at that bottom part of the curve, laying that foundation, creating these areas where native plants can thrive. And then hopefully the goal is as you slowly remove invasives from those adjacent areas that the invasives will really be able to kind of take over. Um, I think of our warrior plants, Ili, Aali'i, you know, if we can just create more kipuka for them, they can outgrow buffalo grass. Uh, we just got to give them a chance. Yeah, and great segue. We actually have another question um, from Bill in the chat who's asking if you're planting taller plants like mamane, koi'a, etc. Yeah, we do have koi. Uh, I'm not sure about mamane. I have to ask um, our restoration guys. I don't think that's on our list of 20, the 25 that we're currently using. So we do a mix for the dryland forest restoration, particularly at Malka. We have found that a mix of grasses, shrubs, and, and smaller trees does work. So we use willy willy, kawaii, uh, um, halapepe, um, ma'o, um, what are some other kind of ones that people really kind of know as they come to mind. Um, and But we also find that the grasses do really well, you know, and again, in terms of capturing that soil and creating a safe, oh, ali, that's our other major warrior shrub. <laughs> I'm like, I'm forgetting a really important one. Um, that's our other real, real warrior plant out there. Um, but, you know, the, the Covello grasses, the Kamano Mano, um, the, the Aki Aki, you know, a lot of that is also essential to helping those larger plants and, and, and trees and shrubs grow because you're creating a, a space where their roots aren't getting dried out. You know, those little plant communities is what we're really seeing is the best way to do it. Um, in coastal areas so far, we've actually found that the trees same thing, they don't survive until we give them a really good foundation of aki aki on which to grow over. Because um, that aki aki is helping retain the water, it's helping keep the invasives out, um, it's creating that like, again, community for that larger tree to really take hold. Awesome. Um, Bill has another question. Has the soil there been tested for bad chemicals from the bombing? That's a really good question. Um, we haven't actually, in the, in the recent future, I'm not sure about when the um, Navy was doing their EIS back in the 80s, um, the late 70s, early 80s, but I know that um, in, the, in the recent future, it has not been tested for chemicals. And that's mostly because um, the public stance of the, of the federal government is that there were never chemical or nuclear weapons used on Hawaii. So um, the things we worry about mostly in terms of UXO is um, in that sense of chemicals is like things like white phosphorus and propellant. So we do have to be really conscious when we think we see as, um, so all Kirk staff um, are access guide trained, meaning we are trained to be able to identify the basic of UXO or unexploded ordnance um, in, in, if they're present in a work area or a project area. So that's one of the things we are trained to identify, particularly the chemical white phosphorus and um, rocket propellant. So we know what those things look like when we're in the field. Mahalo. And I can personally attest to the expertise that Kirk has in their UXO work. My dad was a contractor there in the late um, late 90s early 2000s maybe but yep. definitely um had a lot of um praise for the folks that you guys are doing and the work you're doing um got a couple similar questions um uh, with jordan hey jordan and monty um how can we sign up to volunteer with invasive species removal outplanting beach rubbish removal etc i know with the pandemic it's probably been a little different, you know, when it comes to volunteering as with everybody, but have you folks um, restarted any volunteer projects on Koho Olave or other places um, associated with Kirk? 
Yeah, we were really lucky. Um, when the government shut down in March of 2020, April 2020, we had to shut down our volunteer program at the time. But we were able to rally and implement a lot of really good protocols and procedures so that we could actually reopen our volunteer program in September. Now, albeit, you know, when we shut down, it was at about 12 participants per access with two accesses per month. So about 24 people bringing, you know, 24 volunteers to island every month. We, with the pandemic restrictions and social distancing requirements suggested by um, CDC and DOH, we did have to cut our numbers down. So we could only bring five participants out um, and one access and eight participants out during another access because of the, our bunkhouse constraints, right? So those numbers allowed our, our bunkhouses to meet those CDC requirements. But thankfully, you know, you come to Guadalave, you get who you need when they come. Um, even with smaller groups, they have all been hammers. And so our outputs have, have remained pretty consistent in terms of being able to put a thousand plants in and access. And, um, you know, we had, we cleared three and a half tons of marine debris during our October kind of full cleanup, which was really cool. And um, well, we, we aggregated it. It's being flown off by helicopter next year. Um, but um, yeah, so thankfully our volunteer program has been able to survive this, um, even though some of maybe our staff positions didn't, and we're now in the ledge trying to get those back. Um, but we're we're super grateful that we've still been able to have. And I must say, we also had to cut it to just Maui volunteers um, with all the travel restrictions as well. D due to the logistics of our accesses and how that all works, um, we were afraid of people canceling with potential you know, uh, travel issues and all that kind of stuff. We just recently, um, I don't exactly remember when, but once all those kind of travel restrictions and once testing was in place and vaccinations, so now we've opened it back up to other islands. Um, and as long as they can uh, bring us a negative test um, with their travel and and or attestation forms of their vaccination um, status, then we are, are opening it back up to outer islands now, which is really great. So if you want to volunteer in particular, um, head out to our website. It's listed here on my last slide. Um, the koalavi.hawaii.gov on that page um, on the right side on the panel menu there is a, uh, um, a spot that says volunteer just click that and it'll bring you right to our volunteer registration form um, that goes to our volunteer coordinator I think there's a place in there where you can be like how did you hear about us just kind of put that it was through this presentation or you saw this presentation that kind of um, catches our volunteer coordinator's eye that you're not only um, related to what we do here, but you're already interested and involved in conservation um, in terms of getting a spot on our list. And yeah, and then they reach out to you. Um, I want to say it is easier if you have a group than as an individual. So if you work with an organization or a halal or a community group um, and you're willing to pull that group and lead them and, and be the point of contact, um, that's usually the easiest way to get there as soon as possible. Mahalo. We have lots of more great questions in the chat, so I'm going to sort of combine um, a couple of them. So uh, Beth is asking how much of the island is shovel ready where you can sh uh, safely shovel into the soil and kind of tacking onto that question is Monty asking if UXO removal has ceased or does the military fund ongoing efforts to remove UXO or live ordinance from Koho Olave? So in my humble opinion, I would say zero part of the island is shovel ready, um, mostly for like the common person, mostly because um, if you remember that map, right, only 25% was um, ever deemed to be shovel ready ever. And that was in um, 2004. So we're now going on 18, how long? Oh, uh, yeah. 16 years, 18 years, a long time since that. Um, for, and you know, a lot with all that erosion, um, areas that were surface cleared have shown UXO. You know, we were working in an area in August, 2021 and a UXO unearthed itself or sorry, 2020. And um, somebody spotted something. So our access guide went down and saw the fin of a 50 pound bomb sticking out of the dirt. And so they slowly and carefully um, removed the soil that was around it um, to be able to identify it accurately and then make it visible so people will now know it's there. We flagged it. Um, and that goes to your second question. Um, you know, there are still UXO on island, as I mentioned earlier, once a bombing range, always a bombing range. Um, we're never going to be able to get all of it out. Uh, it's just impossible from, you know, a realistic standpoint, because like I said, it's under things, it's in things, it's been covered by things. They come down riverbeds during major rain events. Um, so even in areas that were subsurface and surface cleared, that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, so 
with those holes you saw digging, um, we'd have to have a UXO specialist walk that line first before we sent out our CIP team. And Paul, our restoration manager, would always joke, you know, those guys were the ones digging the holes, not him. And he would send, you know, someone else to go dig the hole before he would. Um, so there's always that chance. Yeah. So again, I, I would really feel like none of it's shovel ready, but we do use shovels still sometimes, especially in areas where we know, you know, it's um, newly acquired sediment or if we're out on the sand on the beach, um, you know, and then we just are careful as we start to dig in areas we can. We don't dig down more than a foot. Um, you know, a new little seed does not, seedling does not need more than a foot deep hole to be able to kind of take hold and survive. Um, so we're just really thoughtful about how we go ahead and do that. Um, so the final part of that question about funding. Um, again, I go back to that that point that at the time Polavi was turned back over to the state, it was a really unique time in, um, in history in the sense of we weren't involved in any wars. Um, we So our government's funding in terms of defense had a lot of fat that had to be trimmed from the budget. Uh, we had a senator in place that had a really high ranking and was able to be on that defense appropriations committee and $400 million taken out of the defense budget and put into a trust fund for the restoration of Polave and the removal of UXO. Of that $400 million, only about 44 went to um, fund restoration efforts. The rest of that was flagged and that was it. The pot to be able to, what they planned to do was remove 100% surface. So clear 100% surface and that 75% um, to a depth of four feet, that subsurface, what actually happened, which is what you saw, um, not exactly that, but it happened in the 10 years that was allotted with the amount of money that was given. And so that's all she wrote. Um, we always, technically the federal government is responsible for the removal of the rest of their mess, um, but they currently are not funding that responsibility. Um, you know, with us on the brink of potentially another world war and all these and COVID and the financial systems just, you know, not having that extra chunk of money to dedicate towards something like UXO removal on an island nobody goes to, in most people's opinion. Um, it's just not a priority, unfortunately. Um, but as I said, when we do find things that are still potentially dangerous, luckily that 50 pound bomb was not unexploded. It was just a remnant and a dud. Um, when we do find things that really do pose a danger, we do pass on that information to the feds and look for specific support um, when we need it. Great, thank you for that answer. We have a few more questions in here. Um, yep. So Bill Pereira has another one. And you know, as we know, Koho Olave is one of the homes of Kamoho Ali'i, Shark God, and Ohana Tupele. Um, Bill is asking if large sharks come in close to the beaches and Koho Olave. And I'm curious to know too, if you've, you've experienced that or seen them or anything of interest about that. We know um, there are lots of stories in Mo'olalo, but also just, yeah. Um, from different volunteers and people visiting Koho Olave that it is a thriving marine ecosystem. And so, yeah, have you seen large sharks coming close? Um, how close do they get if you do see them? Personally, I have yet to see one, which I am okay with. Um, I do love Mano and I do kind of want to see one in the reserve, but at the same time, um, just to give you, other people have seen them in the reserve. So for example, Paul was just telling me, well, let me rewind. I had a dream um, before one of our lobe days on the boat, uh, last access or two accesses ago. Um, we we knew we were going to be swimming. There was pretty heavy surf hitting Honokanaia. So we would be swimming in gear and coolers and equipment. Um, only two of us are on the swim team right now on the crew, me and Dean, our ocean program manager. So that night, I definitely had a lucid dream that while we were doing that run and that load, I saw a gigantic tiger shark rush through the shore break at Hono Kanaya. It had to be 12 feet long. Um, and I told Dean and he's like, we go, we swim, Maggie. I was like, okay. And, and we did. But in reality, I have yet to see an actual person, thank goodness. Paul did tell me a few years ago, there was a 12 foot tiger shark patrolling in the bay that they could definitely see from shore regularly um, for you know about a month. And then we have some pretty epic footage of a gigantic tiger shark um, that they saw in Kanapo um, in 
Kamaluli Bay, so the the bay that you saw pictured with the marine debris, which is actually that home of Kamaluli. Um, his cave is in that bay, so that is where most of our large um, mono predators hang out and are are usually observed. Um, but with that said, we they also this was kind of an intense um, thing that happened. They had a, a dead dolphin or a dead yeah dead dolphin that was in the reserve, and there was um, they have footage um, in our archive of them trying to get it out of the water because it had brought in these two really gigantic tiger sharks that were like eating it at sea and as they were hauling it onto a hua um, on the deck on the ramp the, the sharks were actually like jumping on the ramp like trying to climb on the boat to eat the dolphin i'm also glad it was not on that day um because <laughs> i don't don't want to see that <laughs> Awesome. Mahalo for sharing that story. I think that really goes back to your title too, and Iola Kanaloa, you know, like bringing life back to Kanaloa. And those sharks might be scary to some of us if we're at the beach. It really is indicative of a very healthy ecosystem. Yeah. And um, that's their home where they're supposed to be. Um, Bill is asking about the big fire that was happening on Koho Olave, I think a couple of years ago. Forgive me if I'm February wrong 2020. In the timeline. Okay, yeah, yep, February about two years ago. Um, did that show any positive or negative impacts um, in regards, especially to clearing out invasive weeds? It's uh, a good point. So it's also the other question about how much restoration has, or how much land area has been restored versus not. That fire wiped out two of our major um, previous planting areas. So one was in Keanakeke, where actually at the time we had the largest ma'o shrubland um, in the state of Hawaii. Um, and it got decimated. Um, so that was really sad. We were really bummed about that. But, um, and I try, I should have put a picture in of it. I have one from another presentation. Um, when we did in April to do our fire transect surveys and see what was happening, some of that ma'o was sprouting and recovering. So um, that was a really nice surprise, um, unfortunately. And it, and while the fire, it did clear a lot of the invasives and we tried to do a lot of native seed drop, but it, you know, we're not out there 24 seven right now, which is unfortunate because that was really why we couldn't take advantage of that natural clearing of all those fire adapted plants. Um, they just, you know, it wasn't a month again until we got out there and they had all sprouted. Um, you know, just little baby buffalo grass and little baby kohole and kiabe everywhere. So, um, you know, when you're not out there 24 seven, it's hard to keep up. You know, that's what we're finding now. We, we do our best to take two steps forward, but ultimately fire, we get out there. We are now back one more step. Um, you know, eventually we'll finish because two forward, one back is still progress. Um, but, you know, the, the, the best we can hope for is more money now in the short term to be able to really ramp up and expand operations in the time that we are out there with the long term goal of back being back out there 24 seven to take advantage of those kind of opportunities um, when they rise. Um, I do want to say we have seen that in some of those areas in Kianakiki, other natural plants did sprout up. So we now have some natural patches of Cressa that didn't exist before that do now. So and a couple of patches of um, Akiaki and then another plant that I forget they found they identified as um, kind of a no name native so it's a native endemic species but doesn't have Hawaiian name yet it's one of those like little weedy plants that they don't haven't quite gotten to. Um, and they are thriving and kind of keeping out the the buffalo grass on the edges. Um, so I'm really glad we do have a grant right now to work in there because it'll we'll be able to kind of um, honor that natural that natural fight that's happening and, and support the natives and expanding their their hold in that area. Awesome to hear that. And yeah, as we know, some of our native plants are not as adapted to fire as some of these invasive species that come in. So it's sad to hear that, you know, those invasives had a leg up at one point, but also nice to hear that the natives are fighting back and you're you're helping them win that war. So <laughs> mahalo for that. And um, actually, if I can add to that real quick, just to right. follow your point, um, one thing we are noticing, at least in the coastal areas, that saltwater inundation with those coastal plants has been really helpful. Um, like Akiaki loves saltwater and buffalo grass hates it. So um, we're using that now as a more um, kind of passive technique in terms of inundating areas um, that have a mix of the two with that salt water for watering and then kind of seeing how that takes out some of the buffalo grass that we can weed it out by the next month too. 
Awesome. And even more reason to go send in your volunteer form and go help out Koho Olave and get those natives in the ground and help out with those yep. invasives. Uh, okay, we have our final question from Monty. And I really love this question, Monty. Thank you. Um, can you give a description of what Koho Olave probably looked like back before humans arrived? What do you think the forest was characterized? And he's asking maybe Ohia, but I don't know, put us in your time machine. What, what do you think Koho Olave looked like before humans? Um, well, we have one ancient kupuna wili. We call it ancient because compared to everything else there, it's pretty ancient. Um, we have one kupuna wili wili tree. That's actually a combination of four trees up by the summit. Um, so I am not a plant person. I am not a biologist, but I think it was littered with wili wili and kawaii uh, and other dryland forests small trees and also littered with kamano mano grass and covelu and halapepe, kind of everything we've put out there that really survives, it feels like it's meant to be there. And it knows it's a'ali'i, just giant, beautiful, thriving a'ali'i shrubs. And, um, you know, pretty much your Malka areas were dryland forests. And then your coastal areas, they were, and even your, um, the two lua we have, the two volcanic craters we have, Lua Makika and Kealia Lalo, um, they were wetlands. They were temporary and ephemeral wetlands. So we were seeing a kulikuli or um, some uh, largely down on the coast, Aki Aki and um, Ma'o. You know, Ma'o was probably, there was probably big shrublands of that because it just takes off on Ko'olave. Um, so I would envision, and again, more of a dryland forest with some pretty nice sized beautiful orange flowered willy willy, but also with brown covers like Ojai. Apparently the Koholave Ojai, the seed that comes from there, um, uh, Fern Duval, maybe some plant person, um, said it was the most beautiful, vibrant salmon colored flowers he had ever seen on an Ojai. Um, so, you know, and they came from, those seeds came from plants they found that were still alive uh, doing, their, doing their jam on islands. So I think it was colorful. I think it was beautiful. I think it was welcoming and, and a really in just safe space for, for native plants and animals prior to even Hawaiian contact um, with that area. Awesome. Eola, I will see it return to that one day soon. So mahalo for your enthusiasm and for all the work you do to um, take care of Koho Olave and all the work that your um, your staff and your crews and your organization um, does to care for this really special place. I'm going to um, just share about what's going on for the rest of the week in our final week of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. So if you have one more burning question, you can throw it in the chat before we're done. But um, coming up, and I think Beth will drop the link in there if she hasn't already. Yep, yep, there you go. <laughs> um, she's always like one step ahead. I love it. Um, so this is our final week um, in Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month featuring talk, um, talks from our Kahakai realm, so in our coastal marine areas. Um, tomorrow, we have a Maui Malka Conservation Awareness Training um, with James Friday, our JB Friday, who will be speaking about rapid ohia death. Um, you do have to do a separate registration for that one. So if you go on, you can um, click the link that Beth sent and register for that. It's a four hour conservation training. The first three hours or so is gonna be just a background and overview of conservation in Hawaii, um, followed by our guest speaker with JB. And so if you've already attended these MCAT trainings, feel free to jump in at the last hour um, to listen to JB. Um, we also have, um, that's going to be from 9 to 12, and then from 12.30 to 1.30, we're going to have toxoplasmosis impacts on the Hawaiian monk seal uh, from Noah monk seal researchers Stacey Robinson and Angela Amlin. Um, later on in that afternoon, we have our Moloka'i Maui Invasive Species Committee members. Um, the whole staff is actually going to be presenting on the upside down mangrove jellyfish control at Kaunakakai Wharf on Moloka'i. So, um, with our Maui team, we really tried to represent all of Maui Nui and um, really thankful that we could help share stories of these invasive species heroes and the work that's being done from Maui to Molokai to Lanai and Koho'olawe. So mahalo Maggie for, for being a part of that as well. Um, and then on Friday, we have our Forest Friday talk story, is Ohia worth saving? So it would be a really good chat with the Kauai Invasive Species Committee and Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project. 
Um, after that, our closing ceremony is next week, Monday, and that wraps up Hi Sam 2022. So hope you folks can join us for the rest of our talks. If you weren't able to make it, you can visit the website that Beth dropped in the chat um, or dlnr.hawaii.gov slash hisk slash 2022 Hi Sam, and you can see all of the recordings from this month. Um, that we're going on statewide. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So with that, I want to mahalo you, Maggie, for your amazing presentation. Mahalo for all that you and your folks do in Koho'olawe. And we will see you soon. Thank and you. And thanks to you guys at MISC for creating this space for us and for others to share that work and hopefully inspire more. Absolutely. Yep. And shout out Hawaii Invasive Species Council are the ones who are sponsoring this event with DLNR and um, yeah, just a great team in the back creating high Sam. So mahalo everybody, ahui ho, hope to see you tomorrow and for the rest of the week. Take care. <laughs>